Welcome to AWS for Data, where we invite experts to dive into the challenges of and solutions to unlocking insights from data at scale. Leveraging real-life experience of what it takes to manage data effectively on the ground, we discuss topics such as data strategy, building a data culture, creating business value with GenAI, and maximizing the return on investment of your data assets. Today, we're delighted to have Gabriel Straub on the show. Gabriel is a thought leader in the data analytics and AI space. He's an independent commissioner at the UK's Geospatial Commission, where he works with the nation's top minds to shape the nation's geospatial strategy. He also lectures at the London Business School on AI and the responsible use of AI technologies. Today, Gabriel joins us in his capacity as Chief Data Officer of Ocado Technology. Yes, that Ocado. They're on a mission to change the way the world shops. So join us to learn how they've transformed the way they manage data to make it the heart of their business and decision making, and how they're using artificial intelligence and machine learning to revolutionize the online experience. Thank you. Gabriel, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Really looking forward to this conversation. You have a broad range of experience with the data-heavy organizations, and I'm very excited to hear more from you today. Could you please share more information about who is Ocado and its 20-year-long data journey? Yeah, sure. So Ocado was started in about 2000, and the ambition at that point was to create a pure-play online grocery business. Um, and what we were trying to do is to create a really great customer experience. And at that point, a lot of the technology didn't quite exist to deliver groceries effectively, efficiently, and kind of with great customer experience to um, people's homes. And actually, one of the things that a lot of people don't realize about grocery, what's different from the rest of e-commerce, is you have to deal with very short um, shelf lives. There is different temperature regimes, right? So we will have frozen items, fridged items, and ambient items. Also, we really realized that in order to get customers to want to shop online, given that their items might go off and there is different temperature regimes, we need to commit to delivering something to them within a fairly short window. And that meant that we ended up sitting on top of quite a complex problem. And there wasn't really a lot of technology out there that either solved this problem or was good enough and efficient enough to deal with the incredibly low margins that you tend to have in the retail industry. And so bit and bit, we ended up building more and more of that stuff ourselves. And then over time, what we realized was that other retailers were looking at us and they were saying, like, oh, how are you able to run such a good customer experience at these kind of superior economics? And we started pivoting into um, supplying that technology to other partners as well. We signed the first deal in 2013 with Morrisons. And by now, we have 12 partners across the world. Jenny, some of the biggest grocery retailers within the industry. And all of them are using the Ocado Smart Platform. Wow, that's interesting to hear. Um, about this technology so Can you expand a bit more about what does the Sakata Smart Platform does behind the scene? Yes, of course. Um, we think that Ocado Smart Platform is kind of the most advanced end-to-end uh, -end, um, grocery e-commerce platform that is out there. For the Ocado Smart Platform, you can get everything from the e-commerce website to a supply chain uh, solution. We take care of your customer fulfillment. Um, be that through our highly automated customer fulfillment centers, or also if you want to do install fulfillment, and also the last mile solution. And because we've been working on this for you know, 20 years by now, we've really optimized a lot of the pieces. And we've kind of really made sure that the end-to-end -end is as efficient as it can be for the use of um, data and AI as well. That's, that's very insightful to understand how AI is used within Akado end-to-end. I'd like to understand a bit more detail, uh, maybe focusing on a few of the business challenges and understand why they are important and how you guys are uh, addressing them. So you talked about Akedo having their e-commerce platform. Could you please talk us through how, what kind of challenges you face in e-commerce and how Akedo is addressing it? Yeah, sure. Um, if you've ever observed a family going shopping with a toddler in a store, or kind of especially if it's a single parent, kind of realize how challenging it is to just do your weekly grocery shopping, right? And uh, Okada Retail has a range of about 50,000 products. Um, that is twice, more than twice as much as the competition had even in their big stores estate in the UK. So the first thing that we really tried to do with AI was to try and make the lives of our shopping customers easier. So we invested into building technologies such as Instant Shop that more or less allows you to create a basket with a single click. And in grocery retail, 
we know that about 70% of your basket is the same week in and week out. And so that's something that we were able to do already, I think, 16 years ago, something like that. It's not something that's quite recent. Um, the second customer challenge that we focus on with AI is around helping um, making sure that our customers don't make mistakes. Right? There's almost nothing worse than doing your online shop and then you get after the cutoff time and you can't edit your basket anymore, you realize, oh, I forgot the milk or I forgot the main key ingredient out of my, my, um, the, what I wanted to cook. And then you still need to go out to a store and you still need to go and everything, kind of all that time that you were going to save disappears. And so we very early introduced this idea of have you run out of, which as you go for your shopping journey and you're about to check out, we just remind you of the products that you usually have that we can't see in your basket. And there's other applications in that space as well. We also have AI applications that help to inspire you because that's particularly difficult online, right? So we have recommendation engines. And then we have applications that help you achieve your goals. Um, at the moment, we know in the current economic climate, people want to save money. And so, for example, we have something that's called flash sales. And flash sales is really there to help provide customers with items at a discount because we think that those items would otherwise have to go to waste because we wouldn't be able to sell them before the expiration date. And I think what's really exciting about all of these applications of AI, we think they make the customer experience better. And we see this because they increase the basket size. But also, they drive efficiencies for the retailer side as well. Wow, that's interesting. So as you're talking about efficiency, and you talked about um, uh, the basket size as well, how do you forecast? Because it's a, it's a large range of products which you have when you shop online. How do you do the forecasting uh, based on the customer demand? Yeah, I think kind of it's. One of the things that we realized early on as well is like it's not good enough to have a good web shop. You have to have, be able to have the right products that customers expect in range. You have to be able to deliver to them to them when they expect them, right on time, and you have to be able to deliver them at a competitive price. And so we did, as you say, we invested into implementing ML and AI models across the whole platform that we have. And demand forecasting was an obvious one to, to focus on our supply chain. Um, as we mentioned, Ocado Retail has about 50,000 products. We forecast you know, quite a while, uh, about three months ahead. Um, we don't just do point forecasts. We actually do probabilistic forecasts. We do this for every single uh, CFC that we run in the UK. And as we're now a technology platform, we don't just do this for Carter Retail. We do this for all of our partners that use our supply chain. So you can imagine about the complexities or the scale of the challenge that we have there. So on the forecasting side, you have mentioned that you're trying to reduce more waste by accurately forecasting it. So we'd like to focus a bit more on t in terms of picking and packing, mm -hmm. um, how you package the items. Can you please share more information in terms of how you do that? Yes, of course. Um, Ocado Technology is probably most famous for our fleet of bots. Uh, if you've seen a video about Ocado, right, it's very likely that you've seen these. About, they're the si about the size of a washing machine, and they're whizzing around on these grids. Yeah. Um, and actually, our biggest uh, customer fulfillment center in Arith it's the six times the size of a football field, right? So it's absolutely humongous. And so there's a really interesting challenge for us to try and figure out which bots should be packing which basket. So basically, okay. the, the way that the system works is that you have this grid, and this grid is full of these totes. And in these totes, you either have customer orders or you have the products themselves. So the first challenge we have to figure out is which, uh, which tote should be where in the grid. And then as we try and bring those totes to the people who are picking those baskets, we need to figure out how do we move those bots around and stuff like that. So it's a fairly complex orchestration. We've been working on this for over 10 years now, and we continuously evolve the algorithms to make this as efficient as possible. That's really interesting with uh, so many number of bots running on your grid. Yeah, and actually, you know what, what's kind of really got me when I, I found this out, like in 2022, um, the distance driven by all of the bots across the world was about 72 million kilometers. That's further than the distance from the Earth to Venus. Right? So you can imagine that like, these bots actually end up being used quite a lot. Imagine if you had driven your car by, for 72 million kilometers, right? like how much, many challenges you might have with that. So we also have like, really clever and fun AI stuff there that helps us try and figure out when is a bot likely to fail, um, what might fail on that bot, and we can take them off the grid and do predictive maintenance before they end up causing an issue for us. That's, re that's really impressive in terms of scale of distance. Yes. <laughs> How do you pick this item? I've heard about on-grid robotics. Could you please share more information about that? Yeah, so the latest innovation that we've been building in that space is we now have these robotic arms. And robotic arms have cameras that sit in front um, of their kind of ineffector. 
And we're able to use these cameras to, try, to actually efficiently pick and pack uh, groceries now using robotic arms. And I think kind of what's really interesting about the way that we use this is because we have to pick such a wide range, we can't rely on off-the-shelf software in this space. We, the way our system works doesn't necessarily identify what the product is, but instead it identifies where to best pick a product without needing to know whether this is a, I don't know, let's say a, um, a kind of baked bean, so whether it is a kind of a, a box of tissues. Um, but like picking is only part of the problem, right? We then need to be able to pack this as well very efficiently into a plastic bag. And we need to do so while not bruising the items that are already in there or the item yeah. that we're handling. Because at the end of the day, otherwise you're going to have a, a bad customer experience or really inefficient economics on the last mile. And so kind of we've been investing a lot into getting this right. Um, and yeah, it, it's impressive to see what those robots can now do on the grid. How do you achieve this? Do you leverage computer vision or any kind of uh, uh, methodology here to train these on-grid robotics uh, arms? Yeah, so it does, relay, uh, it does rely on robotic vision. Um, it also relies on um, imitation learning. And we've been trying multiple techniques to find something that works really well for us. And that takes into account the need for speed, but also kind of the requirement that we need to handle those products carefully so we don't bruise them. It's interesting to hear that you need to do different methodologies to train this uh, on-grid robotics arms as well. So once you pick and pack using this robotics arm, how do you do the last mile delivery to your customers? Can you share more information in terms of what kind of process you follow here? Yeah, of course. Last mile is absolutely key to make this work from a um, profitability perspective. Um, it tends to be between 10 and 15% of a typical retailer's P&L. It's by far the largest contributor within the, the, the kind of that online grocery space. And fundamentally, we need to solve three different problems. Um, the first problem is when you go to the website, we need to be able to really quickly tell you which slots are available. And we need to basically take into account how big your basket is, what all the other orders are that um, people have already made, kind of how full the vans are that already have been committed to, okay. to other partners, et cetera. So that is all about being fast. Once then we know all the orders that have come in, we then have an optimization stage. And at that point, we basically try to be as efficient as possible. We make sure that we have the right deliveries on the right vans and that they're in the right order. And then the third stage would be delivering that to the clients, um, sorry, to the customers. And that's all then like your, your typical GPS routing that basically the delivery driver then follows. Okay, that's interesting. I think from what you have mentioned, you are collecting data in multiple stages from e-commerce, uh, from your operational aspect, uh, from a fulfillment side, and also last mile delivery. Can you expand a bit more in terms of what does your data strategy uh, looks like and how you address this challenge um, using your data strategy? Yeah, so I think kind of in generally, I'm a big fan of trying to almost not have a data strategy, right? You want a business strategy that's infused with data analytics instead. And for us, that means that we're really trying to drive two things with our data. One is we want our organization to make better decisions, and that can be better product decisions or better operational decisions. And the second thing that we really try to drive is like where can we use AI to differentiate our product? We can then break down these two aims into four foundational things that we're trying to do. Um, um, can you maybe expand on these uh, foundations which, you, uh, which you're talking about? Yeah, sure. So the first one is all about like, how do we increase data utility. And these are things like, what is the right data governance structure that we need to put in place? How do we make data accessible? But also kind of how do we make it understandable? How do we make it usable? How do we make it discoverable? And then how do we have the right tools for the right jobs available for our teams? Right? Not every data access at the same time. Uh, sorry, it requires the same things. We have analysts. They have some needs, and then we have data scientists or software engineers that have other needs for that as well. The second of our foundations that we've been working on quite a lot is how do we make analytics as impactful as possible? And here, again, there's some questions around like what is the right data warehouse, for example, that you need to build in order to make sure that your analysts spend most of their time on answering business questions. But it's also kind of the more subtle things, right? Like what is your operating model? How do you make sure the analysts are in the right conversations at the right time? What are the expectations that you set to a product management manager, for example? The third area is around leveraging ML, and that's really okay. about like product management and understanding where is your, un your unique selling point and where can you contribute to it. And then all of this stuff doesn't really work unless you have the right culture. And the right culture is about knowing how to use data. Uh, it's about having the right skills. It's about kind of feeling that data isn't something that you have to be afraid of, but something that in most jobs you can 
kind of that supports you, that, that helps you do your job better. And therefore there it's a lot about kind of, you know, building communities, providing skills, making it slightly less scary. Data is still unfortunately quite scary for a lot of people. Yeah. That's a that's an interesting challenge in terms of enabling the data culture within the organization. I think you already mentioned about uh, community. Uh, what are the steps do you take to make sure that culture is preserved and developed within the organization? Yeah, so I think kind of the, again, there's a few things of how we've tried to address this. So some of it is structurally, um, our data teams are embedded within kind of the business domains. And that means that um, we have a head of data for each of what we call as a stream. Um, and they are part of that management team and therefore can have the right conversations. And then similarly, the rest of that team cascades and is quite embedded within the organization. But it also means that they're very close to the domain and hopefully can have conversations around the domain much more than about data. Right? So it should never be about the data, it should always be about the, about the outcome. And then there's a few things that we try and do across like, the whole organization. And often there, actually, what we're realizing is that one certain domain has trialed something, for example, a kind of data literacy um, thing, or, you know, or sending people data socks or whatever it is. <laughs> and then if that becomes successful, then we try that across other domains as well. Um, and that way, we can run multiple experiments and kind of see what works. But also, it allows us to adapt it really to what is kind of the special needs in that specific area of the business. Thanks for sh sharing that. I think it's good to hear that you are able to fail fast and make score correction, um, course correction uh, within your, uh, to enable your data culture. I want to cover a bit more about generative AI. How you see this will impact your business? Can you share some use cases around it? Yes, of course. I think kind of the first thing that's really important to appreciate is that we're in the business of delivering physical goods to people. And I think kind of that means that our applications of generative AI are always going to be a little bit different to those that are digital pure players, right? For us, we mentioned about, we talked about this earlier, but like having the right products appear at your door in a good quality or kind of in good state when you expect it at a competitive price is something that I think will take a little bit of time for generative AI to be able to kind of um, you know, deal with. And so kind of where we're focusing on generative AI it tends to be quite a lot at the beginning of the journey. And fundamentally, we think that there's probably three areas uh, where generative AI is going to have an impact. The first one is the obvious one, right, around productivity, um, be that developer productivity or productivity for anyone else who's processing a lot of documents and has to write a lot of text, right? This is a prime use case of generative AI, and we're really interested in exploring where that can best help us. The second area that we're looking at is around knowledge management, finding better ways to getting to answers quicker so that our teams don't have to do quite so much searching and that we can combine all of the different sources. Again, I think it's going to be a really fruitful area for generative AI, and it's another space that we're exploring. And then last but not least, we think there is probably something in there around customer experiences that are a bit more inspirational than what you do with the classical kind of stuff, right? Like generative AI is incredibly powerful in making some fairly abstract connections. And we're ex at the moment exploring how we can build some applications on top of that stuff that will add a customer experience that we're not able to do with more classical machine learning. Th thanks for sharing that, Gabriel. Appreciate it. And lastly, I want to ask, where do you see the industry is heading? Oh, this is such a big question, right? Like, um, <laughs> I don't really know. I think kind of we're still fairly early in the generative AI journey. Uh, and so it's even understanding how, where this will have an impact and where this won't have an impact is quite hard to predict at the moment. There's also some excitement at the moment around um, graph neural nets and some of the applications there and what that might allow you to do. Because again, I think we're getting into space which is much more around complex relationships that we weren't able to deal with in the past. I think the other trend that we're seeing, especially from generative AI, is that ability to not just take complex inputs and create simple outputs, but to create complex outputs as well. And I think that's the space just that we're at the beginning of exploring, and God knows where this is going to lead, but I'm sure it's going to be super exciting. Yeah, we believe so. <laughs> Thank you so much, for Gabriel, for sharing your valuable insights and experience with us today. It's been truly enlightening and informative conversations, and we appreciate your time and expertise um, in discussing Akedo's innovation, data journey and your data strategy uh, in becoming a data-driven organization. Your perspective has been incredibly valuable, and we look forward for your uh, continuous success in the world of data and AI at Thanks again for being part of this discussion. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much for having me.